variety. So uh, I thought we could do this in a sort of format that like where we look, so over here I pulled up the bare metal cluster installation instructions. This is a full document that goes over basically everything you could ever possibly think of to get an OKD cluster going from scratch on bare metal, uh, bare metal UPI, I should specify. And over here uh, is my sort of explanation of my setup and supporting infrastructure that I have. This is uh, in that uh, repo that uh, Mike McCune is maintaining. So that'll be available on his repo. And then eventually I think in the main OpenShift OKD repo, once everything's sort of straightened out. And uh, I thought we could just go through and sort of go through everything here and I'll show you what I did in, in my home lab to fulfill the requirements. Like, you know, network connectivity is a really big one. Uh, a bunch of us were talking about that during the, the, se the stage session earlier stuff about like CSRs and creating the infrastructure. And I'll show you the um, the Terraform scripts and the bash scripts and, and the stuff that I have set up to get all of that going. And as we go along, uh, you know, if you have any questions, pop them in the chat and uh, Craig, feel free to interrupt me literally at any time and just like ask me the questions and I'll answer them. And then uh, whenever I get through that, you know, we can talk about, uh, you know, other home lab setups or, uh, you know, uh, if the Dean wants to come on, I think he's in here. Maybe he'll pop away later. If he wants to come back and sort of talk about his home lab setup, I don't know if you're going to talk about that in the single node stuff as well, the Dean, but yeah. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's, I think, um, I don't know. I, I can go first or you can go first. It, I think, I mean, so long as I'm talking, I'll go, and then you can talk about your setup afterwards, Vadim. I think that, yep, mine's not much better. It's just more completely documented, I think. So without any further ado, let's get going. Um, so over here, I, uh, you know, these are the resources I'm using, basically, to get this setup going. The bulk of it is these big three, relatively big hyper-converged hypervisors. They're all identical boxes that I sort of built up over in course of a couple of uh, maybe a year or so, as you know, I decided to get more and more overkill with my setup. They have a Ryzen 5 3600, so that's 12 virtual cores right there, 64 gigs of RAM. Each one of them comes with three four terabyte hard drives, two 500 gig SSDs that I raid one together for redundancy, and then the boot disk for each other. Hypervisor is just some random little budget NVMe. Uh, M2 drive that I that I just sort of stuck in there because that's not the important part. And all of my supporting infrastructure is mostly run off of this one NUC that I had laying around gathering dust. Small little Intel Core i3 with 16 gigs and a slapped a little 500 gig SSD in there. So the bulk of the uh, of the sort of the expense of this is all in here because this is way overkill. Like for any workload any individual person ever could have. But you know what? That's what makes it fun. Uh, my hypervisors are each hosting an identical workload. So this is the way I planned it out originally. I was going to have the size of the cluster be three control plane nodes, one on each hypervisor, and then nine worker nodes split three, three, three on each hypervisor. So my control plane nodes, I gave them four vCPUs, 10 gigs of RAM, and a very small 50 gig root disk. They don't really need much more than that for what I use them for. And the worker nodes get eight CPUs and 16 gigs, 50 gigs of root disk. And then I also pass in one of the four terabyte hard drives to each one. This will get used later to set up the, the Rook plus Ceph cluster for the distributed storage for all of the container workloads. And then the bootstrap node, uh, which is very temporary, it's just another VM that gets spun up. Four vCPUs, eight gigs, 120 gigs of root disk. That only stands up for maybe about half an hour when you need to first set it up. Hello. So like that kind of takes care of the required machines requirement over here. I read this and I was like, okay, let's see how far I can push it. Uh, the boot, you know, the control plane, you'll note I'm, uh, oh, wait, let me zoom in on this so that people can see it. So the control plane here, uh, I, you'll note that I'm really sort of going not as hard on storage as the recommendations say. That's okay because log rotation is a thing. And so far I haven't run out of this space yet. 
uh, the, the compute nodes, I'm over-provisioning, and the control planes, I'm kind of under-provisioning. That's also okay, mainly because the it, as, as you'll see, I have the, all my nodes up over here. Where are they? Right here. Is that showing up at all? Hopefully. But like they don't run out of memory very much as it is. So it all works out in the end for something like this where it's totally overkill anyway. Um, the main important thing that you know took me ages to get going was the, the networking stuff. Oh, dear Lord, the networking stuff. Where's network connectivity requirements? No, is it somewhere in here? Do, 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 do. There they are, networking requirements for user provision infrastructure. This section of the docs took me maybe like a week of just reading and experimenting to, fit, to get it all sort of straightened out what is necessary and what isn't necessary. Uh, it goes into a lot of detail on like what ports need to be reachable from what subnets. And I suspect that is so that, you know, people who have actual real network topologies can uh, set up their routing rules correctly. Whereas I'm just on a flat home network, everything can talk to everything else. So a lot of this actually you can just straight up ignore, which is really great. If you're in a home lab setup that isn't too complicated, or doesn't have too many weird VLAN stuff, uh, things going on. And then... Uh, the, the really important thing that uh, these docs don't actually mention for whatever reason, and hopefully after this, uh, somebody, maybe it'll be me, will remember to make it a PR or something up to the docs repo, is that um, the nodes during their initial bootstrap need a PTR record set up for them to figure out their hosting from DHCP and DNS. If you don't have that, then they all come up with the same host name and then the cluster doesn't come up at all. So, yeah, and as Vadim says, the docs do take like a whole bunch of proxies and meters and all this sort of stuff into, into account. So they look really complicated, even though I think for all, most deployments, at least in a home lab scale, probably even more than that, you don't really need to worry about most of it. And then the important thing is just to have a load balancer. So the docs talk about all of this and talk about the ports and the stuff you need and uh, they also say, you know, you have a separate ingress load balancer. Most people, I think, run the API load balancer and the ingress load balancer, or at least I do, just as the same VM. It's a, I just have a very tiny little VM that only runs HA proxy, two vCPUs, 256 megs of RAM, as little disk as I could get away with giving uh, my little Ubuntu install and uh, a very, very straightforward HA proxy config that I will show you later. Um, it, I adapted mine from the config file that's generated by the OCP4 helper node Ansible playbook, which is a this OCP4 helper node. I think during the main stage, uh, a few people made sort of references to it, but this is what it is. It is a big old Ansible playbook that sets up an all-in-one node that has all of the sort of supporting infrastructure that you need to run a full OpenShift 4 cluster. So the DNS, the load balancer, the web server serves as a bastion, DHCP, Pixie, uh, for you know bootstrapping the Fedora CoreOS or you know Red Hat CoreOS machines, NFS, TFTP. So like this thing, you just point this at a VM and it'll set up to run all of it. Really helpful, but for a lot of people's home labs, I don't know that it is. If, if you can figure out a way to get it all into your environment, it, it'll work really, really well. But if you already run your own DHCP or you run your own DNS, then parts of it become less helpful. Uh, in my case, as it turned out, I really only needed the uh, HA, like the API and ingress load balancer parts. So I just spun that out as its own tiny little VM. And uh, after once you have and then the other half of it is is the uh, port allocations and all the various sort of dns things that you need i don't know where in the docs it there it is user provision dns requirements so all these dns records you can actually set up once before you even you have to set them up before you even try to start deploying a cluster the good thing is after you set them up once you don't have to touch them ever again so that's what i did I just set them up once, and as I experimented with like getting the actual cluster up and running, these are all just sort of one-time things you have to do, and then you can set them in a corner. So, like as I said, because I am incredibly overkill 
my I my DHCP and DNS is both managed by Active Directory. So I have a full AD domain running in my home lab environment, and I use that for DHCP, DNS, and like authentication and LDAP and stuff. So I have all of the, uh, I have my DHCP reservations set up. I know it's really small. You'll just have to take my word for it because I can't, I don't know if I can make it bigger without sort of making it weird. So like you can see all my DHCP reservations here and scrolling further down uh, all of my sort of like the API and API int, all of the various sort of things, like these two are pointing at my load balancer, the everything gets it, all the DHCP static reservations get put here. So I just set this up once, maybe eight, like ages and ages and ages ago, and it all just works. And then especially the etcd uh, records, the A records, and also crucially the SRV records. This is too big. There. Crucially, the SRV records are the actually some of the more important parts for this, which is, I think they're in here. Yes, the SRV records for the etcd server SSL stuff. I don't know why they're necessary, but the documentation assures me that they are, or at least they were when I first set all this up back in the OKD for three, four, four days. Um, also very helpfully, uh, this didn't, this actually didn't used to be there when I set up these records, but they had an example, uh, they have an example zone database now. So that helps to serve as an instructive example and see here are the PTR records that did not used to be called out by name, but now they are, it's very helpful. Oh yeah, and DNS PTR records, look at that. So once you have all of the records and your load balancer and all that stuff in place, you can actually get around to deploying them. So uh, I, I believe that the actual OpenShift install program bundles in the Terraform, uh, Terraform and the Terraform libvirt provider to actually do this for the IPI based deploys. So I just broke that out and I use that. I, I have a whole bunch of Terraform, uh, I don't know what they call them, modules, I think, playbooks, somethings for each of my hypervisors and the bootstrap and they all take care and so i have a module in here that sets up the bootstrap the master and the and a worker node and i have a module just for making sure that i can download and push the fcost base image to to the vms to boot off of and then each one of these uh you know will take care of setting up the appropriate number of masters and the appropriate number of workers based on variables that I pass in. So I, it's all very sort of pluggable. And I have like this file, uh, uh, TF vars that I can use to just SSH into everything and set it up. I'm not running anything very fancy on the hypervisors themselves, just bare libvirt. Uh, I did seriously consider running an OpenStack, but that would have been too much even for me. This was already overkill enough as it was, I thought. And the bootstrap, of course, gets its own separate one, so I can put it up and tear it down separately from the rest of the infrastructure. Um, I'm sort of running through it. We it, it, after I go and Vadim goes, you, uh, you know, there will be time for for people watching to ask more details on all of this. But that takes care of basically getting everything into place, especially this section about creating FCOS machines. Uh, the documentation itself talks about, you know, you want to do a Pixie install or an ISO install. If you're deploying to VMs, uh, a Pixie install is probably a little bit too much if you don't already have a Pixie environment set up that you can just use for this. I think just, you know, doing a bare QCOW2 or having like an LVM thing with FCOS sort of DD'd onto it and then just booting it with Ignition because QMU can pass that in directly and Ignition works with that just fine. And that's honestly my preferred approach. What else needs to happen? And then, so the bulk of my orchestration is actually done with a um, with a script here called do the thing dot sh. It's a it's a fantastic script, and so it takes I, I it's very specialized for just my environment, but it gives you an example of just like here's everything that needs to happen. So I download the latest uh, OKD release, um, I download the latest CoreOS release, and then I create the manifest right here. 
So I have an install config.yaml. Let me pull that up very quickly. Here's my install config.yaml. Really, really simple. You know, my base domain uh, for UPI, you always set the worker replicas to zero. Master, I set to three because that's how many I have. I give it a name, set cluster network, service network, network type, my uh, pub key so I can SSH into the nodes if I need to, and a fake pull secret, which I don't think is necessary anymore, but it used to be, and I just have been too lazy to get rid of it. And so from here, I create my ignition configs. I use Terraform. Terraform has been configured to point at the ignition configs that are generated by the install. I Terraform apply, and then uh, I wait for the bootstrap to complete. And so that's this is what uh, you know we were talking about earlier, like in stark contrast to 3.11 sort of you know giant pile of Ansible playbooks. That I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with that, but it was. It took a long time and could fail at any part of it. And you always had no idea why it failed or what you could do about it. Uh, this is way easier because it's kind of a binary. It either worked or it didn't. Like if this doesn't work, you there's really, don't worry about it. Take the VMs down, try again. And if it doesn't work three times in a row, ask for help. It's great. You don't have to, as, as somebody just trying to use it, and get it going, there's so much less that is environment specific that could go wrong with this setup. And that's very, very I think valuable. I think that's part of the whole reason they did OpenShift four from three. I, I forgot one of the yeah just to chime in, uh, one of the uh meetings I had mm -hmm. attended, they said that they had something like eleven thousand support tickets. I th it generated just off of the different setups from folks using a different OpenShift 3.11 setup. So then now that this is a little bit more mutable, that's the whole reason, you know, it makes it a whole lot simpler. So, all right, that's all I chime in. Care. Yeah, no, for sure. For sure. And then after that, I take down the, the, the bootstrap, uh, after the bootstraps up, woohoo. I sleep for 20 seconds, which is actually too much, uh, for, so I just give HA proxy time to realize that my bootstrap is out of the rotation because I am incredibly lazy. And uh, nope, my port 9000, please. So here's my HA proxy and all of its glorious detail. So like I just leave the bootstrap in the HA proxy and uh, I use the TCP check and it just doesn't route anything to it. It's great. I don't have to think about it. This is again, more like static configuration that I get to just set up once and leave forever. It also takes care of figuring out where my ingress replicas are which is great and the machine config server stuff and all just, it, it's all wonderful. HA proxy is truly a beautiful piece of software. Um, so I sleep for 20 seconds to give a load balancer out of the rotation. And then I sleep for another 10 minutes because something is happening here and I don't know what it is. And so this is kind of the downside of uh, having a sort of very opaque, it, it either works or it doesn't set up. I really have no clue why I have to wait 10 minutes here, but I know if I don't, the API server will sometimes refuse to work. Like I will make an OC call and it'll come back to me and the API server will just say, no, I'm sorry. I don't know who you are, go away. I don't know why, but if I wait 10 minutes, it doesn't happen. So in the interest of just having a run it, walk away, come back an hour later and your cluster's up kind of script, I just sleep 10 minutes, whatever. And then I do this specifically to annoy Vadim. I uh, sit in a loop and just approve all the initial worker certs uh, because I trust the VMs that I spun up 10 minutes ago. And well, the Dean has repeatedly told me, and it is good advice, do not trust infrastructure that you just spin up in the cloud to be from yourself. He's right. I don't know how that could happen really, but he's right. That is a possibility. It's not a possibility in my setup behind my TV here. So, uh, I, I just spin in a loop until I get all of my workers approved. And then once that's done, I uh, label some stuff for uh, the Rook Ceph deployment. That's the other big thing that I do. The four terabyte disks that I use are all, they. I just pass in the raw disk to each worker VM and then each worker is actually running a Ceph OSD on it. So I have basically one worker per Ceph OSD. So I have nine disks in there. So a nine node OSD. Uh, Ceph cluster. So this is all labeling some chassis for uh, uh, Ceph's topology stuff so that it does spread those placement properly. 
but and so actually right about here i did want to point out after after this step after the workers are approved the uh, csrs are approved and they all report ready into the cluster as of right here technically the okd setup part is done um that's the fun part everything after this point so about halfway through my script here, everything after this is just like post deployment configuration or uh, day two setup, I think is the, as the docs call it somewhere near, yeah, post installation configuration. So like act, right after that, everything, like the cluster is up and it is technically usable. It's not very helpful to use it at this point because there's no like container storage, the registry is not deployed, nothing like that. But technically it is up and it could run workloads at this point. And that's very cool to think about. So after that, I, I do some housekeeping kind of things. I patch the ingress controller for my wildcard cert that I use for internal stuff. And so then I have to wait for the ingress to restart itself. And then the MCD reboots all the nodes for some reason. I don't know why. I think it's probably to get the CA certificate stuff in there. Uh, so then I just wait for that to finish. Packed up a little for loop here to wait for that to finish. And then uh, once that's done, I set up my LDAP authentication. As I said, I'm using Active Directory. So uh, I just have a little uh, LDAP YAML that just sets that up. And then after that, I set up Rook. And Rook, because of some fantastic work done by literally everyone on the Rook, uh, on the Rook side of things, is almost easier to set up than OKD itself, which is incredible because I've also set up Ceph clusters by hand or with the Ceph Ansible playbook, and that was, whew, what a battle. So having this is like such an amazing thing that I can just literally OC apply a couple of YAMLs just from GitHub and it'll come up. A cluster will come up. It's incredible. It's amazing. I cannot recommend it enough. Like if you have gotten to the point where you can stand up an OKD cluster or even really a Kubernetes cluster in general and you just have some spare disks, give them to Kubernetes. Put Rook in it. Life is so much better. It all just works. It's incredible. It's amazing. So I just I set up my storage classes and my and my pools and stuff. And that's kind of a tangential thing. I can go into more detail about it if anybody's interested. And then I just wait for uh, the cluster to come up, the Ceph cluster to come up, and then after the Ceph cluster is up, I tell the uh, I tell the uh, registry to go use it. And so it goes and just makes it a, a PVC for itself. I wait for that to bind. I patch the registry so it does the external route. I send, I configure metal LB, which is the other half of the magic here that allows home labs to just be super, super, super overkill and cool because load balancers are basically the only way to, <laughs> uh, as far as I understand with my, I will admit incomplete knowledge of the Kubernetes ecosystem in general. If you have something that can't be routed through your ingress controller, non-HTTP traffic or something like that, um, then basically the only way you you can get it out is via load balancer or a node port. Um, I didn't really want to do node ports, uh, but they were I was using them as my only option for a while until I discovered Metal LB, which is basically, it makes it feel like you're running in a real data center because it will just use like ARP uh, to broadcast a random, like uh, advertise for a random IP and it'll just redirect traffic to it and it works really, really well. I would recommend everybody to just deploy Metal LB anyway, just so you have access to some, to like load balancer type services. And then I configure my monitoring. Uh, I have, I have, I, it like OpenShift comes and like OKD comes with all this monitoring. So I just, I have a little helper program that I will pull up. It's, it's just a tiny little thing written in Rust. I actually have it linked from my, uh, from my OKD deployment configuration guide. Here it is. Just a small program I wrote that it's just a little web server that waits for alerts from the alert manager and will just post them to Discord. So I have basically my own ad hoc single person monitoring and alerting setup, all thanks to OKD. I shudder to think how much work it would be to set up the Kubernetes mix-ins and do all of the Prometheus stuff manually from a vanilla Kubernetes cluster. So this is honestly a huge value add for OKD in my book that I get such comprehensive alerting for free. I've gotten alerts for everything from, hey, the NTP service isn't running and your, and your clocks are out of sync to your etcds are slow to, uh, you know, hey, you've got a PDB up. 
uh, you know, during updates, uh, like Rook sets up PDBs for the set clusters to make sure that the that the uh, rebalancing is settled. Like it's really, really comprehensive, and it all just works, and it's amazing. It's amazing. And that was the final thing I disabled the samples operator because I'll never use it. And then after that, uh, I'm done. And so this process, all of these steps, end to end, takes maybe hour and a half, two hours on my infrastructure. And it's totally repeatable. I could take the cluster down right now and spin it up again. And two hours later, we'd be right back where we started. And so then at the end of it, I have a 12 node and completely overkill home lab cluster in which I run basically everything. A whole bunch of stuff that I used to just run in bespoke random VMs, I now just run here. And I have cron jobs for backups. I'm you know, running all kinds of weird things. I as an experiment, set up an authenticated SMB share. So I'm running a domain join Samba as a pod stateful set inside of this cluster. That's really fun. Like it, it's been, it's been all, it took a while to get here, uh, you know, cause I, I had a single, I had a single machine sort of, I think it was three node. Okay. Uh, OpenShift origin 311 cluster that I started with. And then when OKD4 came along, I sort of was very eager to, eager to hop on the train and sort of make the home lab as big as I wanted it to be. And, but now after a lot of overkill, I'm in a really cool place. And so that that's kind of a quick overview of my totally, totally unnecessarily overkill home lab setup. Here's some just software I run in it, completely not worth the amount of resources I've thrown at this, but who cares? That's not the point. Uh, and with that, I think I, I think Daniel's I'll let go of the asking to, for a link to the the repo that you've been showing. It's it's also yes. private. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's yeah, it is private because there are secrets all over it, <laughs> right? Like uh, the the this is half of it. The other half is services, which is where I have all of my uh, like I deploy all my workloads at, with Ansible playbooks. So like I have a role for each sort of namespace that I run stuff in. So these are all the services I'm running and like there are secrets all over here. So I unfortunately can't make it public. I can pull this, I can pull the uh, the scripts out that I'm using. There's nothing too uh, weird in there. I, I will definitely think about pulling the scripts out and adding them to uh, the uh, deployment configuration guides as an example. That's a good thought, but I can't show you the scripts as they are now because secrets, secrets all over here. It's a private repo. I don't know. Just so that I didn't have to worry about it. Yeah link to the deployment configuration guides. Awesome. Yeah. That that's my fork of it and it'll all be merged into the main one, Elmico or Mike McCune. And then hopefully afterwards that'll just all end up in the main OKD repo. Yep. So that's that's my stuff. How do I unshare? There we go. So that that's my uh, completely and utterly overkill home lab setup. And I think Vadim's also got a much more tame, normal type setup. Tame, yes, normal, no. <laughs> um, do we wait for questions or should I just jump in? Um, I don't know, honestly. It, whichever way you want to do it. I don't know if there'll be, maybe we can go through both of our setups and then uh, yeah. we'll take questions. Good idea. Yeah. Okay, uh, so I'll share my screen and we'll look into my setup. So first of all, do not, am I muted? No, I'm not. <clears throat> first of all, do not repeat this at home. It runs a single master, meaning you probably won't be able to update. Uh, second of all, it's very, very slim, unlike three stuff on resources. I have a machine with 20 gigs of RAM and the other one is default laptop with eight gigs of RAM. You won't be able to run there much, but as an example of how low uh, Giddy can go, that kind of works. Uh, so the pinnacle, the part of my core part of my stuff is my router, which is a standard edge router from Ubiquity. Here's a picture. You can enjoy my insane cabling skills. Um, it provides me with PHCP. And I have um, all the hosts been to their particular MAC address. 
And somehow it also manages the DHCP in a way that the hosts get their host name automatically. I don't know networking that much. Uh, I didn't use any PTR records and such, but somehow it just works. Um, another part is that the router has DNS mask embedded, but the UI is terrible. This is why I've set up an AdGuard home um, here because I can set up a TLS, DNS over TLS, and that would stop uh, pushing my ISP to the limits because for some reason it hates UDP. And I can also define uh, my own custom hosts here. All of them are pointing to my load balancer machine effectively. And so that's that. Uh, that's the router. Next comes uh, my storage box, which is here. It has NFS, it has a single node Ceph uh, cluster. Also, don't do this ever. Uh, but I need it because NFS is so bad that for, for SQL, basically, it doesn't work with it entirely. So I had to host a simple uh, block storage so that I could use CSI and run some software which uses um, SQLite. This host also runs a typical uh, HE proxy, also copied from uh, the helper node, which has a very, very standard uh, HE proxy uh, template. Next come the actual hosts. I have just two of them. And I initially provisioned a laptop, which is now my compute node. I started it with uh, as a bootstrap node. It has eight gigs of RAM, it's barely close to what the bootstrap needs. If you have a chance to get a 16 gigs of RAM, that would save you a lot of time. And um, I also upgraded the default SSD disk to something M2, also pretty small, um, because the etcd was happy but was showing quite a huge latency during upgrades because this is the time where you pull a lot of images, start new containers, and I said he was very unhappy about that. Uh, yeah, pictures. Um, it's just a box. Uh, that's my Ceph uh, dashboard. Also don't do that, but since I have, like, I'm using 20 gigs of it for the storage. I don't experiment on this cluster, just actual production. So that's more than enough for me. Um, and that's the view of my OGD stuff. I run quite a few projects there. Most notably, the most helpful operator is probably the pipelines. Because what I can do is that I can change things on the console. Unlike the GitOps approach, I change things in the console. And periodically, I think every couple of hours, the script uh, runs and saves all the manifests using OC Atom Inspect. It saves all the cluster versions, operators, node status, all the OLM operators I'm using, inspects all the projects I have access to because I'm not much interested in default OpenShift projects, removes some nonsense from it. Uh, I don't care about particular parts. I don't care about events. Um, I strip the boring stuff from the YAMLs, generations of link, and so on. And finally, it gets committed, saved, and pushed into my internal uh, Gitia instance. So every couple of hours, a new commit is created. I can see what has changed in that cluster. And I should rip that out. It's boring. And I should rip that out too, and so on and so forth. So it helps me track back of what has broken and kind of restore the state of my cluster back to whatever I had, especially if a particular application breaks down. Um, another useful operator is Snap Scheduler that helps me create snapshots of my PVCs here. Do I have access to it? Yeah. So I use Ceph as a CSI um, volume. 
then nope, no snapshots. Maybe I this user doesn't have nope. And every couple of hours or days, it creates a new snapshot. So if something breaks in the application itself, we can easily uh, roll it back as a PVC and replace. Next comes a wonderful piece of software called Loki and Grafana, which stores all the container logs almost effortlessly. I think it uses 150 Mac, and each prompt tail agent uses 70 Mac, which is nothing. But I can do searching by logs, for instance, and so one's force. Okay. Um, the biggest downside of this setup is that since it's a single node, it's incredibly hard to update it. All the operators would work fine until it stumbles on machine config because machine config has a setting that no more than one um, master node can be down at all times. And I only have one. So what I have to do is to make it reprovision it back to original. I'm fetching the master's machine config, annotate it with the desired config notion, that node as if it has already upgraded, and tell machine config daemon to upgrade it, to reprovision it, the whole stuff. It doesn't work out of the box because it also tries to install necessary OS extensions like uh, QMA agent and, and most importantly, network manager OBS. So I have to cancel it in the middle. And if the node doesn't come back, I have a small heart attack because I would have to fix it. Uh, this has bit me quite a few times, so use it at your own risk. Um, installation, yeah, that's covered. Upgrading. This is very dangerous, but the the whole issue is supposed to be fixed in 4.8, so I'm really waiting for this to land in stable. Uh, useful software, yep, this Grafana is provided by the Grafana operator, which takes care of all the data sources, the dashboards, um, and can upgrade Grafana from one version to the other by just changing one uh, setting in the operator. Uh, Snap scheduler covered, Tekaton also covered, um, useful software, uh, your own Git server, um, home assistant, great stuff to control uh, smart home appliances or just collect all the information in one single piece. Uh, Bitwarden to keep passwords. Minio is an S3 like storage. I don't think I mounted it anywhere in my apps, but certainly possible with different CSI stuff. Uh, Nextcloud, a terrible PHP application, but it does the job, syncs the files across multiple devices. Uh, Navidrom is a great music server, which follows the AirSonic protocol. Uh, Miniflux is accessory there. Um, a lot of federated stuff like Matrix Synapse and Pleroma. And the Wallabox is a great application to keep the pages and read them later. And I think that's probably all I've got. Two, two very different extremes there. I like it. Yeah, that's awesome. Hey, uh, Vadim, did you have a, a link to that um, page you were just looking at on yeah. GitHub? Um, yeah, there is also a pull request to send three, basically. That's what it was, OK. Um, yeah. Well, that would be a good time, I guess, to ask if there were any questions for either yeah. either home lab. Or we can just sit here and nerd out about how cool all this is, because this is very cool. Um looking at your script tree that yeah. catching stuff in the middle of the deploy. Yes. I think, Which... I think it can be worked around, or rather the proper way to implement this is to pass manifest to installer. It has a special folder where right. you would put stuff and tell it to keep applying. 
I, like yeah, this, this one. So this we, when you when you change the wild card, I think it makes your. Oh yeah, since you're patching the proxy, that certainly makes the MCD lay new files. So instead of getting one consistent config in the beginning of the boot, it gets it in the middle, so it makes them reboot. That should save that, some. Time. That definitely will save me some time. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't realize that everything. I, I. To be fair, I have not really looked at all of the YAMLs in there and tried to figure out what they're doing. So, like everything, all of the uh, cluster configs, all of that stuff gets laid out in that folder yeah. first. Cool. Rather, it get mixed in into what the OpenShift installer generates. Right. And either you there is a create. Create manifest I, command to lay them out. I think, yeah, I think I run them both because I actually do have to set the master schedule schedulable true to false. Mm, Not that that yeah. it doesn't it doesn't break anything anymore, but I'm unreasonably paranoid about running random workloads on my masters. So I, I think I yeah I think I played with it and it almost broke everything. So I I put Throughout, it back. They all get merged into one in the end. So there are two ways to approach this. Either generate and do set, or create your own. Wait, no, maybe it won't work with a scheduler config. There has to be only one. Or maybe it would. So the other option is you lay out just the master schedule uh, change into its own YAML file. OpenShift mm -hmm. installer merges them as if it was changed in the beginning and generates the ignition file. So from that point, it looks as if it was, has been there forever. So I can, I can make a whole file that just like sort of is a patched yeah. subset of this YAML, put it in that folder, and, it would, and so I guess as long as I named it afterwards, it would, it would merge it? Yeah. Again, it's only possible if you have it statically. Like there is no right. complaining there. Yeah, yeah. But everything I'm doing is totally, totally static. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But so, proxy stuff certainly should save you like a lot of time. Yeah, most most of the time here is just, um, and this will also answer the question Dan just asked: What provider? I'm using the uh, Libvirt Terraform provider. I think that's what it's called. This guy. This I also believe is what gets built in, is one of the providers that gets built into the OpenShift install itself. Uh, for use for the libvirt IPI deploys. So this this provider is extremely handy. Uh, it handles doing the ignition, it handles disk configuration, network configuration, the whole smash. It's It basically does almost everything and they also provide an XSLT escape hatch to configure bits of the libvirt XML that uh, it doesn't quite know how to do yet. So extremely flexible tool, that's what I run against. So I just have it set up like each one of my uh, or is it inside Terraform here? So library, library three, and library four. Those are the names of the three hypervisors. Library two is the NUC, um, which gives you an idea of the ordering of how all this stuff got set up. Um, so library, library three, and library four are each of the hypervisors. And in here, I have a I have a main, and so like host equals var dot host. So they all just set up, and it will deploy a master and three workers with all of the config file and then each of the modules in here, I'll just look at the master one as an example, right? So this is um, this is all using uh, the lib the resources provided by that provider, libvirt ignition, libvirt volume, libvirt domain. And so like this all just gets, uh, these files uh, get passed in by up top. It's, it's kind of confusing to sort of see it all in one place. Let me go up here and I'll show you. So like, uh, for example, this this con this content thing. So this is where the ignition file comes in and that's var.ign file. I actually specified that up here in, in the per hypervisor config. And so that I set a dot, 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 dot config master.ign, which in turn is where the OpenShift install binary spits out its ignition files. So once I run all of that, I just pass it here the provider ships it to the hypervisor, sets it, sets QMU up to use it, and then from there it all just proceeds as if normal. Super, super convenient. Saved me having to set up a whole Pixie server for the temporary purpose of, of deploying these VMs uh, like the docs recommend. 
And I think that's probably something we could we could tell people if they have an entirely virtualized environment that uh, to use a, a provider like this. I don't know how helpful it would be in a generic sense because UPI is literally everything, and this is kind of provider specific. But I'm very it, nervous about recommending people what to do because yeah. they should know what they want and. All we can give them is a bunch of options. Like this is why we we're collecting all right. the guides, and I think, focusing yeah. on some particular way, like use Terraform, that's not the right way to, to do that. Yeah, I, I get that. But just an example of what you can do with Terraform and patience. Like most, most I think the, long, the longest part of this, uh, unfortunately, is waiting for uh, the. Fedora Coro is download, and then I, I actually have an LVM library set up to like chop it out. So I have to like uh, turn the QCOW2 that comes down from the FCOS thing into a raw, and then take that raw and DD it uh, four times for one master three workers to three separate LVM things. That actually is what takes the longest, unfortunately. And I don't think there's a way around that. Oh, well, but Mo actually setting everything up is fairly quick. Just gut measurement. I wonder if you have access to cluster API. Like when you set it up, you don't get any machine sets, right? No, I, I no machine mm -hmm. sets or anything. Cause I would need the, uh, the libvert thing. So I, that would be another approach, but I don't know how flexible the, the libvert uh, machine operator is going to be. That's something to look at, but I definitely have, it's interesting. I've, I've seen the project, I'm sort of keeping an eye on it, but for now deploying it statically is the is the way to go, especially because I need to, it's, it's a very static configuration. It's only ever going to be these 12 uh -huh. VMs and they're going to be set up exactly just so. So I don't like the health checks would be the thing that would be super helpful to have from the machine set. I don't really need the auto scaler. I have no use for it, but the machine health checks would be cool. The health checks are basically implemented for spot instances. It doesn't make yeah. much sense in Libvirt world. But yeah, if you don't have an autoscaler, then having the whole machine set cluster API thing is probably even a bigger overkill, which is a challenge. Yes. I'd be I'd love to figure it out. And so like, yeah, these are all just auto generated, but they're all here. I don't know what to do with them, but it shows me them. Yep, the main part is the nodes. I some, uh, it's funny, it, like you know, all of this and like all of my all of my RAM, legitimately all of it, goes straight to. Uh, how, do, how do I do it? Yeah, nodes, or I guess I can go to projects, right? And I can sort. You can go. Legitimately, mm -hmm. all of my RAM goes to, to goes to Ceph. I have no idea what it does with it. To be honest, I should. I don't. But yeah, 45 gigs, basically 44 gigs straight to Ceph. It's half the reason I had to go this wide in the first place because uh, when I tried to set up smaller Ceph clusters, they just ended up eating all the RAM on the host itself and I had no room left to run actual workloads. Does it go to actual OSDs or something or the Golang part? Yeah, it's it's all to the OSDs. Hmm. I, oh, please. Oh, all right, it's happening. This this view always takes a while in the per project view. Wish I knew why. It, this is also probably because my etcd cluster is slower than it should be. But I think I've so, seen a bug related to that. It's a console bug. It shouldn't take oh, that. There it yeah, goes. <laughs> this is certainly yeah. console bug. <laughs> I'll go straight to the pod view then. That'll work. So all of them, all of the OSDs are at the top and they all, they're all they all very uniform, but they all sort of go up to around four to six gigs and then kind of sit there. I have no idea why. I suppose Ceph is doing something with the memory. Everything else is kind of tolerable, the Mons and the and the MDSs for the for the CephFS. But in in general, because, uh, because Rook is upstream of, uh, I think, OCS these days, they have special OpenShift support in the upstream Rook project. So I get to set up uh, the, I get the, the PDB support, which is very helpful, especially during rolling cluster upgrades, which is possible and works pretty much flawlessly with a multi, with this multi-master setup I have. 
So kudos to everybody on the OKD team for that, the OpenShift team, because that can't have been easy. Um, but the PDBs are really, really cool because uh, the Rook operator will set a PDB as it reboots worker nodes. So, or in it, from its view, nodes with OSDs on them. So it'll reboot one of them, wait for it to come back up, and then wait for the, the Ceph cluster itself to settle and stop rebalancing before it reboots the next one. So my cluster upgrades take longer than they should because it's not just a quick VM update. But on the other hand, I don't lose data. I don't like get my data availability interrupted at all, which is very, very, very cool. Yeah, the consistency and disruption are the principle of the upgrades. The time is yep. not. Rather, we care about control plane upgrades. This is super important. And workload disruptions. If it takes you years to upgrade, sad, but you can move on. You can still keep on upgrading, and the worker notes will yep. catch up. So that's the trade-off we have to make. No, it, it, I totally get it, and, it, and I'm just, it, I just wanted to point out that it works like extraordinarily well. It all like in the PDB sort of fit in with it nicely. It's like little things like that that I'm thinking. How would I set this up with like a, a vanilla Kubernetes, especially like these these views here with the monitoring? Where where is where is the world's best dashboard? Here it is, world's best dashboard. Uh, Neil, are my scripts public? Sadly, no. There are secrets all over them, or all over this repo in general, like actual secrets, like my private key and stuff that I use everywhere. So I can't make this repo public. I can try to pull out the scripts, but they're not really, I, I don't think they'd be helpful for anybody who isn't me because they are very, very, very specific to my uh, hardware topology, as it were. But I can definitely you show them as an example or annotate it or something. In the in the in the configuration guide that I have here, and sort of do that. Uh, have have I experienced entity slowness? Dan's asking. Uh, do you believe that's a config problem or inherent to the hardware I'm using? I'm pretty sure it's my hardware. I honestly, this is like the weirdest issue I think I've ever ever seen, because it's weird because two of my nodes. Every now and again, they'll be like, hey, etcd is running slow. And then it just resolves itself a few seconds later. And then the third one is just rock solid. And so that's what the world's uh, worst dashboard likes to show me a lot. Because um, the disk sync durations here, like you'd see four of them are up in like the fifth, like the, the too high. And then one of them's in like the six millisecond, four millisecond. And the other one's like 100 milliseconds and 90 milliseconds. It's identical hardware. I have no idea. They're all like almost the same spec. I think the only thing different is the motherboard. Very, very weird. See, and like now that I'm using it, they, these both spike up and the third one is just fine. I have no clue. Zero. Yeah, that's all. I mean, the leader, the etcd leader would have a worse sync duration, of course, but yeah. two of them, it's a bit odd. It, it, it is weird. Uh, I haven't figured out any rhyme or reason for it. I've seen that some things like there's some the back before I sort of leaned off of there, there was a time when like um, OC get cluster versions was consistently like, hello, uh, it takes 60 seconds for OC get cluster versions. And I was like, that's weird. So there, there are some oddities about etcd and what it's running on. And it doesn't seem inherently related to disk usage because they're they're nice SSDs. They if I go look at them with a IOSTAT or something, they're fine. But that's sort of troubleshooting for another time. Neil, could I split out the secrets into a bash file to source or something? Perhaps I am I am kind of thinking about uh, figuring out some way to sort of fold, like to pull in the secrets from a separate private repo and then have all this stuff up public so that people can reference it. Um, I might, I might put some more effort into doing that. It's just not been uh, mostly on my radar. But if people are interested, I'll, I can definitely make the effort over a couple of weekends to do so. Yep, Diane's also chiming in like, please do. I certainly will make the effort, yep. Anything else? 
panels? Anybody have a prospective idea to set up their own home lab? Doesn't have to be overkill. What if, since you're using three hyperwaters, what if you set up an LKD as mm -hmm. a bare metal, then you can have a schedulable, you can have schedulable masters. And then on top of them, you would set up Kubebird and run LKD clusters within there. Ooh. I think four seven or four eight has a native cube weird integration. No clue. Yeah, works, but. I, it. I think you just have to sort of enable it. There was a section in the docs about it, if memory serves. Somewhere down here. Uh, maybe? There, I don't know. It wasn't in the installation somewhere. somewhere. Yeah, but the. The problem is it would be very would interesting. tie all your machines into effectively one hypervisor, so it might be not that reliable. But yeah. Yeah, one fun of my... stuff to play with. Yes, definitely something very interesting to play with. But one of my primary goal here was to just see how highly available could I get something that wasn't running in somebody's cloud. Like the reason I, I'm using Active Directory, which is a complete tangent is because Active Directory is basically the only thing I could find that does transparent DHCP failover mm. back and forth. So after the first time that my DHCP server decided to crap out for some reason, and I woke up one morning and nothing could get a DHCP address, I was like, this sucks. And AD was the only thing I found that can transparently fail over DHCP management to another computer and then fail it back to the, to the first one when it comes back. And so that, that's actually a lot of the reason why I'm using AD, even though it is in itself incredibly overkill. Interesting. I haven't heard of a lot of DHCP failure stories, but yeah. Load it, the, the, load I, the VM itself mm -hmm. crapped out, unfortunately. And so it took DHCP with it. But yeah. I don't know. Okay, folks, I have to drop. Um, yep. I think I'll, I'll rejoin in a couple of hours to see if some questions need answering. But if yep. uh, something left and answered, let's keep it in, in Slack. We'll get back to that. OK. Have a great That's evening. Bye-bye. Yep, later. We can continue chat in here, or if, uh, if anybody else has any questions, Neil, Dan, I know you guys, and I know you've heard my stories about this before as we were setting it up. Other than that, Craig, I don't know, got anything else? I got nothing. Good stuff. Pretty awesome home lab there. I'm impressed for sure. <laughs> you spent a lot of time. It it's like. too much time. I think because I, I think Neil and I actually first started with an OKD like single machine three node cluster, like uh, not OK, OpenShift Origin 311. So like I first started this path in, when was it Neil? 2018, 2019, somewhere around there. And it's just, yeah, 2018. And it's so this is this is a three year in the making home lab. And I think I finally got it to somewhere where I can sort of use this as a base to ex to play with because everything before was just like getting it going. And then as soon as you got it going, it would break and then you'd have to do it again. It was. That's you do time and money, Neil. Yeah. you up, brother. <laughs> I've been telling them that for ages, but of course now is not such a good time to be buying consumer hardware. Sadly. It, it is. It's incredibly dumb now. I buy all my stuff used. I think that might be the only way to do it, but even the used market now is starting to get, like, people are starting to understand that, like, prices are inflated, so they're, like, even on eBay, stuff is going up now. And a lot of, and the other part of it is I actually built like, I actually built my boxes from scratch because if they're sitting just a few feet away from me, I can't have like big rack mounts or like the Dell power edge type things. 
be too loud. So, unfortunately, no one's really selling their old gaming PC chassis, and if so, they make me pay too much for the graphics card. Yep. Yeah, if you come across a 730 uh, or a 3070, you, you let me know. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still rocking my 1080. I'm running a R9 390 from five years ago. This was the year I was supposed to upgrade, man. Yeah, you picked a bad I, year. <laughs> I thought, hey, five years? That's enough use out of one graphics card? Nope. But yeah, these scripts, I mean, Neil Neil has been badgering me for ages to get the to get these, uh, to polish them up and bring them out publicly, but or to turn this repo public, but like especially in here, like, and I think it's worth looking into like the, the, just the flexibility of the Ansible playbooks. I know the guys who were, who are, who are maintaining the, oh, the Ansible collection uh, for like the, the K8S module and then some community.okd operators on top of it, they dropped by, um, they dropped by the working group a few meetings ago to talk about their work there. And so I've actually been using the Ansible stuff really heavily uh, since way before they, they showed up simply because like, I'm more familiar with Ansible than I am with like Helm templating. Cause like all of the config maps and stuff, you'll note it's just, it looks like a config map uh, or like a normal, uh, Kubernetes YAML file. But I, I think the Jinja templating is more powerful and flexible than Helm templates, which are, it's just text interpolation. It's not, it, it's a little bit too iffy from, for my purposes. I, I just pr I prefer Ansible uh, because I know how to use it because I think the templating is more powerful and it also makes it really easy to it because Ansible sort of focus on just being able to reapply the same thing and it'll incrementally make progress. It's super easy to if you mess something up, it'll stop right there and you just fix it and it'll keep going. Whereas with Helm, like I know Kubernetes itself has the capability to do that, but I can also mix in other types of configuration if I need to into one of these playbooks. So that, that's also super powerful enough to script it uh, with, I can just use Ansible to do everything. I don't have to worry about a bash script that has to also helm and then maybe a little playbook for something else that I need to set up. It's really nice to be able to standardize on one thing and Ansible has the most flexibility. So like I, I deploy everything through, um, through, uh, through Ansible. And one of the neat tricks I actually found, which I don't recommend anybody ever do for a real production workload, unless they really know what they're doing, but it's super helpful in a home lab environment where you, where you don't have to care is that, hold on, let me go find a good example. I think, yeah, the media stuff is full of it uh, right here. So like what I do is I, I have a OKD has the uh, image streams have the capability to monitor an upstream uh, tag for changes and when the tag changes, it'll pull it in. And that's super helpful. So what I do is I just set up a build config that triggers on type image change from, so I set up a tag here that's just upstream and that looks at wherever the upstream Docker image is. And whenever that changes, it triggers the build config to do a new build and then the deployment config and then that build config pushes it to a tag that's only used internally. Oh shoot, I'm not, you're right, Dan, I'm sorry. Dang. You were on All such right. a roll. I didn't want to interrupt. I was following you. <laughs> no, no, please interrupt me. <laughs> so as I was saying, this is a very neat trick for home lab deploys to just keep your the stuff running inside up to date without any manual intervention whatsoever. Uh, and the key and the key is that uh, OpenShift uh, image streams and image stream tags can just keep it can auto will automatically pull an upstream uh, Docker image repository for changes to a tag on an upstream image. So like here I have this image stream tag called internally jacket upstream. So this is a, a tag in the internal registry, jacket upstream is monitoring the, the GitHub uh, container registry tag jacket latest up, uh, up, in the, up on GitHub's infrastructure and it'll pull that for changes. And anytime it changes, it'll pull that down locally and send and trigger an image change update, which gets picked up by the build config, which will then, uh, which can then rebuild the image stream tag 
Uh, and then I say, okay, do a build based on that upstream image and push it to an image stream tag called jacket latest. That's just an internal one. And then down here, my deployment config is watching the jacket latest tag and it will trigger a redeploy. Uh, every time that uh, every time a build succeeds. So once you set all that up, so long as there is an upstream tag that you know sees changes, whether it's a latest or, or a version tag or something like that, every time it changes, without any thinking or manual management on my part, it will literally just push and redeploy and it's wonderful. So like if I go to builds here for media, you can see like a whole bunch of stuff. So like, you know, here's the, you know, you'd see this one's up to 33 and it just does it randomly whenever it sees an update, whatever time of day. I believe by default, they, they pull every 15 seconds, which is aggressive, but I can't change it. So we're stuck with that. And uh, the deployment configs or rather the pods down here, you can see like all of the various deploy pods from all the various versions. It just happens. I don't have to think about it. And like, you'll note like this one here, these two didn't work for whatever reason. So it just stayed on five and I have to go figure out why that didn't work, but whatever. But honestly, that's really, really powerful. And to get that in a vanilla Kubernetes distribution would be, I'm, I can't even really think of a good way to do it out of the box. Like you'd have to cobble together two or three different things, like maybe an Argo CD or there's a thing I've heard that people use in smaller like K3S setups called Watchtower that can do something similar. Maybe that one only works by monitoring the local Docker daemon. It would be a pain to get that working, but with uh, with OpenShift and OKD, it's just basically done for you. Really, really handy. And it's just one of those things like a lot, like to me, the biggest things that just make my life easier like a lot of the a lot of the toil around maintaining a big distributed system like this, whether it's for prod or for personal use, it's just setting up the sort of automated sort of little toil tasks. You know, getting monitoring, getting alerting, figuring out what to monitor, figuring out what to alert on, setting up like automated image deploys for the things that you know you can set it up for, things like that. All that sort of just day to day sort of blah stuff that's not really interesting or fun, but has to get done anyway. OKD just does for you. I have really comprehensive monitoring, like, and I get that for free. They're using, as far as I can tell, the upstream Kubernetes mix-in uh, monitoring stuff, and that all just gets deployed and it works, and then it monitors the worker nodes themselves for disk space or NTP, anything I could think of. I've seen alerts for all of it, just while playing around. Super helpful. Uh, it makes me feel like I'm a badass, and it frees up my time to worry about like actually like doing more complicated things with my workloads. It's a, it's a good springboard to jump off of rather than I think uh, most of my time would have been spent sort of setting up all of that supporting infrastructure is just more stuff that I have to set up to, you know, get to a level of confidence in, in what I'm running. And a lot of the times people don't just, just don't set any of that up. And like, you know, they get surprised when their stuff fails. And you know, while that's okay in a home lab environment, it's not okay in production. So, yeah, that sounds spot on. Yeah. That, that's just you know my two neat tricks. You know, run a rook, run a Ceph. It works. It is by far, I think, the easiest way to get a Ceph cluster deployed of any really thing. Anyway, yes, it assumes you have a Kubernetes cluster somewhere, but once you do. Ceph is like laughably easy. I don't know how they did it. I suspect black magic. Daniel has an interesting question. He mm -hmm. says, when people ask you why in the world would you run Kubernetes in your home lab, what's your favorite example of a workload that Kubernetes makes easier for you? I think honestly, the, the monitoring, um, just being able, because um, it's really difficult to set up proper, proper, like sort of monitoring and metrics management for internal stuff to the point where a lot of people don't do it. So that is kind of an open shift I, thing. I don't know if I okay. can, if someone asked me if they want, why would they run OpenShift in their home lab? I'm not so sure I could give an answer that would say 
it's worth it running OpenShift in your home lab for an application or a set of applications. I will, right. I, I, it's, I run it in the home lab and see other folks run it in, the, in their home lab to help understand OpenShift. And maybe I maybe I answer this question wrong, but I use it more as a learning tool in the in the home lab as opposed to running like actual work. With it. Yeah, I I I think if if you already want to run Kubernetes, the the people who would want to run Kubernetes in their home lab are the sort of people who are already sort of the sort of people who are sort of messing around with Docker Swarm or you know manually setting up Docker composes for everything that they're running, like all their sort of mishmash of internal little home labby type programs. Those people, I think, would be well served to move to Kubernetes simply because it gives you a lot of stuff for free that you either didn't know you were missing or knew you were missing but didn't really feel like setting up. Things like log rotation, things like uh, you know ready checks, things like uh, failover. If if one of your you know random little knock boxes fails, you know will your workloads like you lost everything running on that box? Uh, it, it's a it's a it's a platform as much as it is a a tool more than it is a tool. So when I it Kubernetes doesn't it makes it makes my workloads easier to run, but the nice thing about it is that the the nice thing about Kubernetes is that any workload that you are already sort of managing yourself with Docker, you now don't have to really manage. You just put it in there and it'll run and it'll be there and you can get to it. And that's really powerful because it makes it super easy to just throw new things in there because all of these home lab type things are to, are giving people options to run it as a Docker container these days. And so it just makes it really easy to just take what they give you, chuck it into the cluster and it's just there. Like I, at this point, I'm able to deploy new stuff in maybe minutes to hours um, which is no better or worse than it would have been with Compose, except I get so much more for free. Stuff that ordinarily would have taken me more hours or maybe even days to set up for each individual application. And uh, Neil's following up. Yeah, if you if you have OKD on top of Kubernetes, the best because, like, if you if you if I were to make a crude comparison to Linux distributions, right? Vanilla Kubernetes is like Arch or Gentoo. It's a, it's a base, it moves quickly, and you are meant to bring your own sort of opinions and workflows and put them on top of it, right? Arch boots you up to a, to a console login screen. You're supposed to install your programs, your workloads, your whether you want GNOME or KDE or something. OKD is trying to be more like the Ubuntu. They already bring their opinions about stuff, but they make it fit together very well. So the Ubuntu or Fedora of of the sort of Kubernetes world. And for people who just want everything out of the box to get stuff done, I think OKD is a fantastic option. If you're already committed to looking into Kubernetes, especially once the single node cluster stuff comes out so that people don't have to, you know, set up multiple machines to make it all go nicely. And, but they'll still get the advantage of updates. And that's the other thing. I don't have to update any part of this setup manually. It'll just say, hey, your cluster is going to be updated, and it'll take care of updating the, the containers it's running and the underlying base of us. That's so big. I don't have to remember to SSH into everything once a month and run apt get update or something. It, it just happens for me, and it's all tested. I what wonder how many people are it. using Rail as their base OS on their worker nodes in OpenShift 4. And, and I also wonder if they wonder. <laughs> they realize how much they're missing out. <laughs> I know, right? Because I, I figure uh, Arcos, right? Red Hat Core OS probably has some there's something similar to it for OCP, like we've got with Fedora Core OS here. I don't have enough money to pay Red Hat for. Arcos, yeah, no, so I mean, I, I don't actually. So, know. Yeah, you could use the Arcos. Is it, going to be the immutable deal, right? But you can use like straight up real, like mm -hmm. real A, uh, and then then you won't have that. The over the air. Oh, type of you things, mean like? Right? Oh, right. The so thing I where wonder you can how many people are just run like, rail. Just use our worker nodes is is rail and and not and not use core OS. I, I, I mean, I, I wonder if they know what they're missing out like, on. I really hope I 
for I, I suppose ignorance is bliss in that case. Maybe they're happier not knowing because they might be kicking themselves if they realized how much they would get out of the box if they just sort of let the community or upstream handle that for them. Because it is honestly amazing, right? Like just I'm thinking about like as soon as FCOS puts out ARM builds, I'm switching all my Raspberry Pis to use to use FCOS in containers because it it just the management is so hands off with it, right? You only need to go into it if you notice something is broken. Otherwise, it'll just keep chugging away. You don't have to do any toil. Like so much. I think that uh, that that's the word I use. I don't know if anyone else like toil is just like the sort of maintenance stuff. It's sort of a chore. It's sort of like, oh, I don't want to do it. It's boring, but I got to So much easier. And that's the thing. Like, yeah, it took me a while to get all this set up, but I mean, I this was I got this basically locked in January, February of last year, somewhere around there, and uh, that was back in the OKD for four, four, five ish days, and ever since then, I've just been able to upgrade and redeploy clusters. Yeah, four, three. So I've been able to upgrade and redeploy cl the, this cluster over and over and over and over. And I've been able to bring it back exactly as it is every time. And that's amazing. Just being able to work with, you know, can just infrastructure that I don't have to worry about tearing, like what happens if I tear it down? What am I gonna lose? Do I have all my configuration? This kind of forces you to do everything sort of properly, which is, you know, that's helpful in and of itself. Like, this is all I need. This will set up the exact same workload that I had. It'll bring everything in. It'll restore from backups. It all just works. And once you have your pattern figured out one way, you can just do it forever. Yep. So, well, I wouldn't, I, I, I can't recommend you know, running, I, I honestly wouldn't recommend running your own Kubernetes in a home lab, even on RPIs or something like that. There's just too much extra stuff you need to worry about to make it actually usable. Uh, and there's a lot of there's a lot of hidden things that you don't really think about because Kubernetes is big and complex, and there's a lot of little things that could break that you'll never know about because Kubernetes is really good at keeping going even when half of it is actually broken. That's the one thing I have noticed. Very good at that. Got to give them props, but. You'll never know that anything's broken until everything falls over. And that's happened to me before when I've just been testing out a K3S. Because that was where, that's where it kind of, I, I did a sort of side foray into seeing if vanilla K3S was a, was a good option for me. And in some ways it was, it was quicker to stand up. It used less resources, but I never had the confidence in it that I could like put stuff on it and it would stay running two weeks, three weeks, four weeks later. Because a lot of times it never did. This OKD cluster has been up for, I think, a couple of months now uh, through various uh, version upgrades. Works fine. I, I, I'm i pretty sure I, I'd be able to keep it up forever at this point. Yeah, Neil Neil mentions that his vanilla K8S cluster keeps falling over. And I think that's just because, like, there's the, it because it doesn't come with anything other than the bare minimum, you need to put your own monitoring stack into it. You need to put the Kubernetes monitoring mix-ins in and collect them. And then that'll that'll definitely tell you what you're doing wrong, Neil. But you have to know to do that. You have to put them in there. You have to set up something to collect them. You have to set up something to look at what the what the Prometheus has collected. It's a whole deal. I just get all of that, and it just works. And, and the cluster's up, and it's stable, and it's fine. Very very helpful. And my programs just update themselves without even, with, I don't even notice because of the, you know, the whole sort of deployment stuff. Wait until the single node clusters come out, Neil. Then you'll be, have somewhere to run it because it'll just be any old VM that you want. I don't know. That's the one thing. I, I, I kind of want to know how they're going to do rolling updates on the single nodes because this thing, as Vadim was mentioning earlier, it was... Like it'll update a master, but it, the etcd cluster needs quorum, so it knocks one out, updates it, knocks the next one out, updates it, knocks the third one out, updates it. But with a single node cluster, I don't know how they're going to do it. Maybe they'll just, I'm sure it'll be some measure of hackery. 
I do not. Do you know? I saw the okay. Dean in his yeah. demo. He showed some code, and I didn't quite understand it, but it, it looked like it might allow him to do an update. Did you? Yeah, his, his thing, he because he knows how everything sort of fits together. He's definitely, he's, he's hacking something together in the YAML to trick the machine config daemon into thinking it already did the upgrade by just overwriting a YAML file, and then he uh, tells it to pivot and reboot. Because normally the, the machine config daemon, my understanding of it anyway, is the machine config daemon is the thing gets its orders from the machine config operator, and the operator is keeping track of who's rebooted and when and like what state everybody's in. And then as that works, it'll instruct individual machine config daemons to do the OS tree pivot and reboot process. So the machine config operator is like, I've only got one master, so I can't reboot it no matter how much it wants to. So it'll just sit there. And so he's tricking the machine config operator into thinking that it can, that the machine config daemon has already rebooted. And then he just manually kicks the reboot. And as he points out, that's it, it'll it almost probably will never work out correctly. <laughs> so yeah, Neil mentions maybe it'll require user notified reboots. I think that probably makes sense. It'll probably be like, hey, I did as much as the upgrade as I could. Click this button to reboot. Like that would be the best case scenario. I don't know if we'll have that for four eight, but I'm sure that's probably where they want to get to. Yeah. I wonder if there's a way to just... Hey there, how are you guys hey, doing? It's really good, you just finished chatting. all your demos up. Awesome sauce. Yes, yeah. Did you get any feedback on what we should be updating in the um, documentation? And uh, yeah, so Sri, I a heard... A little bit. I was list I've been jumping in and out of the different sessions. And, and I heard that you had lots of secrets in your scripts and it was so custom, custom to what you were doing. So I, I knew that... Out of all the times uh, to listen, yeah. she heard that part. I did. You know that. That <laughs> that would be the part I jumped in on. That's awesome. So, so yeah. So so. Yeah. No, I definitely. I I I think that you know I, it's possible for me to split all of that to like you know sort of pull out the stuff that's specific to my setup, or at least have that script in. I think I want to have it eventually mm -hmm. in the OKD repo, just as like here's an example mm -hmm. of what you can do. And I, I'll flesh out the stuff I'm writing up for Mike McCune's yeah. thing into that. Probably. So, and I, I, it's probably killing Neil right now that he's not on stage, because, um, <laughs> and I'm not sure if we can add him in to do that. I'm not quite sure if we can invite him, but um, yeah. So I would love to see um, maybe today. Um, he's in, Neil's in three different sessions. That's what I like about him. See, that's that. That's yeah. that's that's so. Um, what I would love to see you do today is at least um, put, put, make a, a, a pull request for a stub for your um, for your documentation into El Maiko's, um repo, um, and you know just say this is a holding pattern and a, and a link to any of the and maybe just put the additional resources that you had um, that you've shared with people. I think I, I saw a few things get shared in there in that stub and get that in there as a holding pattern for this approach to that and um i didn't yeah so I, yeah and and craig if that background is real on your behind your chair i love that it if is real these are is, these are panels from amazon seriously so that is, I'm, I'm in a basement and it's it looks really bad you know, <laughs> so I, I ended up framing it up and putting these up to make it look a little bit more uh, professional you look just like rock and hipster ops uh, uh, Awesome. And I'm in my um, partner's basement in the art supplies because, uh, as we all know, I have no Internet at my house. That's why I pay for fiber optic. So it goes, so it goes out on days like this. And um, yeah. Do you have soundproofing with those um, those panels? No, I, I think it makes acoustics worse. Oh, <laughs> helpful. Um, so I, I know you did a blog post, Craig, um, and I. I I haven't uh, looked at El Maiko's repo lately, but I'm wondering if there's a, if you've entered, make, could make a stub for the stuff that you've done to link out there so that we have access yeah, the, to that. The, the most recent one I've got is for four or five, and I'm in the process of writing a four or seven. So, but also while I've, while I've got you here, I, you know, I've been using Medium to post my, uh, 
my guys just because it's a little bit easier, but I was curious if you had any other suggestions of a better way to do it that's maybe as easy. Well, um, I yeah, am. I today I saw your OKD.io blog option. Yeah, we do. And and that's pretty good. And if, you, if you're fine with markup, which I think you are, um, that's an easy way to put it there. I'm not sure you're going to get the same traffic as Medium. And I kind of like Medium, too. What I'm uh, not a proponent of is documentation by blogging, though I think for some of this stuff, you know, it is one off kind of thing. So if you can, if you did it in Medium, we could put a stub blog in the okd.io blog that link back out to your Medium. That's what I would suggest so that you drive some traffic both back and forth. Um, but also to think about in the way that you're documenting it, you're writing this blog, what about it? Um, can we put into the deployment guide um, for home labs and you know how we and, and I don't have a real opinion about it it's just that I would like those deployment guides um, to be updatable and maintainable so like when we go to 4.8 and that, and that sort of stuff that someone could pull in an issue and do it so um, I think a lot of it is that you know the guides that the, the other guys that you're talking about are complete like they show they show the steps to say you need to do this this and this and this but they they don't actually take the time to show you how to do that because you're really kind of supposed to have already known how to do that. And the only difference is in my guys is I go through and show that step, which is kind of a pain, honestly, but yeah. uh, it helps folks who are learning who I think a lot of folks kind of come to OKD and then, and then go to OCP eventually, which is why I, I did it that way. But I, I'll definitely do that. I'll, I'll add a step. That would be great. And, you know, even today, what I'm trying to do is just get people to make to that, take that first step and pull it, you know, make a pull request to put the stub in for it, you know, sort of commitment, halfway commitment um, to getting that there. So if you can um, take the time and do that today, I'm looking to see who's uh, there's six people with, and three of them are us. So um, I'm wondering about the other folks who are here, Kareem and um, Daniel and Neil, Neil, who's floating back and forth. So maybe just um, Daniel and Kareem, what different what is the, the major difference between your home lab or your um, Fantasy Island home lab and Craig and Shree's? You know, how, how different are you guys from that? And it, does that deserve yet another home lab blog post um, with instructions? What, one thing that came out today watching, uh, Vadim showed his home lab and it was kind of interesting to see, you know, because Vadim is on like this whole other level. And it was interesting to see his home lab, and it was interesting to see Shree's home lab. And it, it's just uh, to get to get to go through and look at er how everybody has something different set up. It's like, okay, well, I like that part. Oh, well, maybe I can use that. It, it would be kind of a cool um, demo just to have everyone kind of show off their home lab at one time or another. I don't know. Maybe it's maybe, what do you think, Shree? Just is that too yeah, much? Yeah, no, I think out? that would. I, well, I think it's like the perfect amount of geeking out because, like, there's so little documentation just out there in general for Kubernetes, just like you see a bunch of people like here's how I got Kubernetes running on my raspberry Pis, And like, there's no one who sort of is like, here's wacky stuff. Right. And like both Vadim and I are different sort of spectrums of wacky. He's got, he's going wacky in one direction. I'm going wacky in another direction. I think it'd be very, very interesting to see how wacky everyone can sort of push their OKD deployments. And I think a lot of us, probably have something that's weird in one way or another. Yeah. So it would be super geeky, but it would be very, very cool. Yeah. And and I think one and, and I think you, you hit the nail on the head that I think the home lab approach is where people learn and where they're experimenting. Daniel's got his he's not even running OKD yet. So he's got a single machine um, going. So when Daniel, when you get yours going, um, I expect a blog post at least out of you um, and coming to the OKD working group and um, and we'll we'll do that. And then if yours is significantly different than Craig's or Shree's and Vadim's, I'm I'm really interested in having all four or multiple home lab configurations linked into the um, in, into the into the deployment guide because I think that's the one of the many value propositions for OKD is helping people get their home lab set up, learning, um, and and getting and getting some experience with this. Um, and I think the the issue for me has always been is that um, DIY Kubernetes was great, but then I could never do anything after that. So um, yeah, no. I could get it installed, it was running yippee, but I couldn't get I really couldn't get an, an app running on it. Um, and you know. 
and I wasn't even trying it on a Raspberry Pi. So um, th that was yeah. And you know, then then I run out of time because um, that's yep. kind, of, kind of the whole thing. We were actually just talking about that before uh, before you came in. It's just like running Kubernetes by yourself. You get it up. It's almost nothing. You have to put everything into it still. Nobody yeah. will tell you what it is. And then your cluster will fall over because something went wrong or you didn't configure something quite right or some piece of the hardware fell over. And you have yeah. to throw it away, do it again. It's a pain. It's a huge yeah. pain. It's pain. But, and, and I don't want Kubernetes to be painful for anybody, even if they're not a Red Hat customer. I want everybody to have a good experience because it just, you know, when people have bad experiences with stuff, that just says, okay, well, I'm going to go over and do something totally different. And then we get all this, we don't get their feedback. We, we lose them from the communities that we're supporting. So that's, that's kind of it. And, and I'm old school. I've been um, on OpenShift team for a very long time. I just hit my eight years working on OpenShift, which is, and I came on board because I love the promise of platform as a service. I, I, I was a Heroku addict. Um, that went in. Um, I even did. I worked on Cloud Foundry and at Active State for a little while, and then came over to um, OpenShift land. And for me, the Nirvana is that wonderful dev experience that we were promised. Um, and then going to Kubernetes was kind of, um, yeah, poor Cloud Foundry. Um, I know, and, and I and, and I appreciate what Cloud Foundry has done and where they're going and all of that. So I, this is not really me slamming them. Um, that that more what I'm I'm interested in is getting back to that early days promise of platform as a service. So and I think what we are doing with OKD is getting us close to that. It's still what you guys had to do today, much more complicated than I wanted. But you know, the the nice thing about it is I was able to point out that I was going when I was going over my script originally, I was able to point at a point maybe about halfway through and be like, at this point, the cluster is technically set up. Everything on top of here is customizations for my particular environment. So I think it's a lot better. It's a lot better than my old Kubernetes scripts, which were based on, I think, K3S. And this was like maybe two or three years ago. And those were just, it was not pretty. It was not pretty what I had to do to get K3S going. I, I think K3S is better now, of course, but still, OKD yeah. is by far a nicer experience. So um, I know we're all here chatting, but um, I don't want to keep you guys away from your weekend longer than you need to be. Um, so um, thinking we have come to a, a, an imminent closure of this conversation. So if you um, leave speakers um, and if no one, Daniel or anyone else, and you want to go over to another session, maybe go hang out with the uh, single node cluster people who are still probably bootstrapping something. Um, and just slowly merge into whatever the final session is that people are still yabbering at. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll do that now. And um, I will say thank you. And you should find an, an invite to um, join us at KubeCon EU in your inbox sometime next week if you haven't already um, done that. Well, hey, thanks Sounds for putting good. this all together, thank Diane. Yeah, thank you, Diane. All right. Take care. Thanks, guys. Jump to another right. session, everybody. All right. All right. See you.